can I ask you who, how many of you are, are in the educational system that are working in that system now? How many of you are parents uh, and you're here? Are you here to hear about like what to do? Because somebody said, you're going to tell me all the things to do to fix everything now. <laughs> are you interested in policy? I want to make sure what we talk about is what kind of want to do. Well, I am part of the parent council uh -huh. in our school, but I also have a, a child with autism. And there's a lot of children in our school with special needs. Yeah. I'm here also to help my son, but also to help the kids in our school, right? Right. So to get information. What can we do? Sort of yes. what can we do together? Kind of? Yes. Okay. That's helpful. So let me tell you quickly. Um, I wanted to, I mean, it's a great conference. I wanted to be here uh, earlier, but I, I was at my son, I, I won't tell you that story anyway, but I was at my son's hockey game and he's eight. Um, my youngest son's eight and he, um, Scored his first goal today. Hey. Yeah, you know they move around like a pack here. Right? Uh, I mean, he's got one hand a sticky knot spin, so he goes and he goes to the bench and he high fives everybody and then he comes skating down. I'm at the other end to the glass and he just goes, Daddy, did you see that? And then he goes back and that is something that uh, I'll live with forever, right? I don't know about him, but that's not going to be me. And so today when I I'm thinking to tell you even that story, I'm just thinking that, you know, this conversation is actually not about the school system. It's about the kids. Um, and I, I often think when government thinks about things, they forget. They think we're talking about, you know that saying, and I've heard it too many times, it's not about you, it's about me. You know that saying? It's not about you, government. It's about the kids. And so we can get them um, or school boards or teachers to stop worrying about themselves and talk about the kids, and we'll make progress. I'm convinced that's the strategy. Um, my, I'm, the, I'm an officer of the legislature. Uh, that means that's who I report to. It makes me independent. But because I'm an officer of the legislature, I have a, an act that I, I need to follow. Um, I want to tell you just in briefly what it, some of it, so that you know uh, maybe we can be helpful to you or how we could join together. Because um, it, it's important to know the limitations of my act, but also the opportunities. Uh, so the first thing I would say is my act um, calls me a provincial advocate for children and youth. And that word advocacy is defined in the act. So there's a legal definition that the definition of advocacy in my act is partner with children and youth to bring their issues forward. That's actually, in fact, I think it's the only legal definition written in a piece of legislation of that word advocacy. So the government and the legislature said that's what advocacy <coughs> is, partnering with children and youth to bring their issues forward. The key thing in that, in that definition is the partnering. Um, it's elsewhere in my act. It tells us to be an exemplar in child and youth participation. Um, it tells us we can do individual rights work, so we're, the Act also says to um, look out for the rights of children under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child or the Education Act or in the Child and Family Service Act and use that as a framework to guide some of your work. Um, but it also says you can only advocate with consent of the child. Um, to them, the people who framed the act, they thought it made sense because we're supposed to partner with. So it means if a parent asks us to advocate, oftentimes we say, can we meet the child? And find out what they might think and want and raise their voice, make sure their voice is heard. Um, it doesn't, and I don't want to get hung up in this, but I'm just going to tell you, it doesn't actually specify the age of the child for consent. It, um, like other laws in Ontario, it um, uh, asks us to assume capacity of the child and then if the child can, doesn't have capacity to instruct us, either they don't understand what the issue is or they're too young, then um, we're supposed to take the parent's point of view and that access, take the parent or guardian. Um, yeah, what were you going to ask? 
Well, I'm just thinking that, uh, you know, I, I don't know a child anywhere who would like to be, you know, labeled as needing spec ed, so I don't think you'll ever have their consent. Well, let me get to that. Yes, yeah, so, I, wanna... I, I mean that, I like, with all due respect, I, I, well, I'm gonna, I, I I'm, What I'm doing is telling you the act, mm -hmm. so you can say it's not good, but yeah. that's no, okay, no. that's my act, I didn't write it, that's the job I have. And I want to get to your point, but I'm going to remember it when we talk. Because there's a, a young person who I should have mentioned, Sammy's right here. And uh, um, you know me, I don't want you to answer that question now, but I'm sure you will. Um, and Sammy's part of a project we have, I'm going to tell you about how I have something to say to move a mountain. Hundreds, if not thousands of young people with special education needs want to talk. They have something to say. They're angry. Angry. Probably as angry as their parents. Very angry. And some don't have parents. They're even more angry. There needs to be a space for those young people to communicate and have a voice. And I'm going to talk to you about that. But I, want, I still want to tell you about the act. I want to get to there. And I want to tell you why that... You know, I'm, uh, I am emotional about the issue now. I'll explain that in a sec. And I want to get to it quick. So we can do individual rights work, 1-800-263-2841. I have my card, so you could phone us. But it's not, I just want to say this, it's not every child that we can advocate for. The Act says children or youth seeking or receiving service under the Child and Family Service Act. So that means, and I've interpreted the seeking part as on the margin. So any child or youth connected to children's aid or in danger of being connected in some way, the children say, any child or youth connected to the youth justice system or in danger of being connected to youth justice and in custody, any child or youth connected or in the children's mental health system. And the Act also says, take a special interest in children with special needs. I didn't use that word special needs, the Act does. And when you look at the legal definition of special needs, it's as broad as you could imagine. So. A mild learning disability to a medically fragile child that's in a hospital and might die and their life expectancy isn't very great. Anything in between, autism obviously is in special, this category of special needs. So Mac tells me to take a special interest in them. I'll tell you the way I think of the office is that there's all this promise and frameworks and action plans and strategies and policies that government makes and municipalities make and boards make and there's a gap between that and what lived experience of parents and children is. Huge gap. The gap in my estimation is not bigger in any system than in the school system. Not, there is no bigger chasm between what the promise and promises of the school system are and what actually students for instance with special ed needs really actually live every day. The gap is huge. Our office is designed to fill that gap with the voices of children and youth, bring people around them, that's how I understand it. Once they speak, you fill the chasm, they speak, you bring people around them to create change. That's whether we do it individually or we do it together in a, in a bigger systemic effort. I would say that the Ministry of Education sometimes doesn't agree with my interpretation of our act. Sometimes they argue. Most boards in the province do agree. The Ministry of Ed, I'll say this now, and the Minister's coming. The Ministry of Education is a beast. <laughs> it is. And I'm not saying anything that anybody doesn't know, right? The Ministry of Education is a beast, and it is very hard to push and move. Um, I'll say that the Ministry of Children and Services is from the Ministry of Education's point of view the tail wagging the dog in any issue involving their students. Um, that's just how it is. Health is a beast and education is a beast and they're very difficult to move. In fact, sometimes now, I would say the Deputy Minister uh, doesn't return my calls and can do that. I found next of lawyers to, uh, and they're also the Ministry is the first to lawyer up, right? The foundlings of lawyers to to deal with issues. So it's a struggle to figure out how to move them. 
But you know that typical thing, and this is where I want I want to say this. Um, this parent said, "Yeah, you can." I, I would just want to tell it. Typical call. So this parent's calling about their five-year-old, and um, the five-year-old is supposed to start SK, and the parents say, "I don't." Said they told the school in their neighborhood they didn't want him to start because he has anxiety, he wasn't learning that he had, he's behind. And the principal says to the parent, no, you have to start. Not already understanding the parent might know the child better than the system, but no, you have, that's the rule. That's, they even told the parent, that's what's in the act. Sorry, we did got to start. And if you don't start, then they'll just start anyway the next year. You can go into, they don't have to go, but they'll start in grade one, right? So parent puts their kid in SK, trusts the system, right? And the child falls, continues to fall behind. And because that anxiety is struggling even in SK, there's no EA in that SK. And there's no supports to the teacher. But the issues arise enough so they have one of those team meetings the parents say. And the kid, the child gets, um, the parents saying the child gets pushed over into grade one. What a transfer, right? And that's, you know that? idea of kids keep getting transferred, transferred, transferred. For me, talking to parents in, uh, particularly uh, black parents have m in groups I've met, made the argument that their kids get pushed and transferred from grade one to grade two to grade three to grade four, and they get transferred and transferred and transferred until grade nine, and they're in high school, and the transferring stops, and now they're done. Oh. That's the story of many kids. Mm -hmm. And now the transferring stops, and guess what? They end up in the Roy McMurtry Youth Custody Center, some. And they're certainly not in school. And when I'm in the Roy McMurtry Youth Center, I'm going off topic, but the average age of kids in custody in that youth center, 16 and a half. The average 16 and a half year old in the province has 16 credits. The average young person in that youth custody center has two. Yet nobody's made the link between, oh, could that be something important to think about? No. They think about how do we do school better in the Roy McMurtry Youth Custody Center. So anyway, this parent is saying, my child's been uh, moved to grade one. And then they start with, uh, we have a team meeting and then an IEP. And then the teacher has these IEP. Well, first the parent was saying they set together and there was a social worker and the guidance, not guidance, a counselor and occupational therapist from the board and you know that how a team meeting works and the principal and the teacher and the parent and then they start judging, you feel like, the parent says you feel like they start judging how you're doing at home and what's going on and this is actually not an educational problem, maybe it's a behavior problem and they talk about that but they don't get that the child already has a label and a diagnosis of anxiety and is falling behind in understanding and be able to do things and maybe that's the cause of some behavior. But they do an IP to talk about that and the teacher has 25 kids in the class. I don't know how many others were had the IP. But things just progress to worse, to worse. And the teacher, the parent was telling me that the teacher uses the principal's office as a place to send the kids if they're not behaving well in her class and disrupting the class, go to the principal's office and the vice principal has an iPad there and they give the iPad to the kid and they play on the iPad to give actually respite to the teacher in grade one. That's not what the IEP, the parents said, said to do, but that's what happened. So they complain and then they bring in a school board person to come and look at the class and give some more ideas to the teacher to do and that's part of the IP. The I IPRC is coming, of course. And then the teacher ignores the school board's suggestions. The principal doesn't seem to have the ability to support the teacher to do what's necessary. The principal says, well, we, we have an EA for a couple hours in the class, but we got one EA for the whole school, and we've got bigger problems than your child in this school. Do you want us to take the EA from? That's what the principal says to the parents. 
And then one day, the parents get a call, and it's a grade one kid, eh? And that your child's been suspended. Grade one, six. And the parent goes, what? Like, you can't suspend a six-year-old. Yes, we can. And um, come and get him. And the, child, the parent says, you can't do this. I'm going to appeal. And the principal says, well, when you come and get him, I'll give you the form. And you can fill it out. And then, but the parent says, but it's going to be too late. Because the principal says, that's OK. We can take it off his record. And the parent was telling me that, that uh, you know, after that happened, on Sunday nights, the child would cry himself to sleep at six and say he didn't want to go to school because one, he felt stupid, and he was anxious about going at six. Yeah, so that story, that's me. That's my kid. The kid who scored the goal in the hockey game. And I'm thinking, if I'm... I don't want to swear because it's on camera, but I'm the potential advocate for children and youth in the province. And I have a very strong wife. And if we can't get what we need in the school system for our five and six year olds, what chance do the parents that I met in North Toronto, who are immigrant parents with, with children who have autism, children who are disabled, children who have the same kind of need, what chance do they have? I'm negotiating that system. What chance? And then what chance do those kids have if they don't get what they need? It's unbelievable. There is no greater gap in this province between what we promise children and what they get from that school system. I believe that. To my core, I've experienced it. And when parents call, you know, I think uh, um, sometimes my staff would think that the parents, and I think the school board thinks that sometimes parents get unhinged. Like they actually, I think they actually call crazy, the crazy parents. There's a category, I'm sure. It's, it's a crazy parent call. But it's, and I get it, right? When parents call, when they call us, if they've gotten to us, if they found out about us, I think they're at the last, they've managed to find a way to get to us or learn about us because the school system won't tell them. They're at their wit's end, and I get it. Why it might appear that this parent is unhinged, because it's, it, I feel it. You, you get that I would know, you care about your kid. The parents I met in, well, across the province, and wherever I've gone, who are so caring, concerned about their child, and thinking about their child's future, those are the parents you want. And, and they're looking at what's happening. They're seeing what's happening to their child. Of course, they're going to be upset. Of course. And the more that you get labeled as that crazy parent, the way your child's gotten labeled, the more, quote, quote, crazy you're going to be. And then they use that against you, right? And then those team meetings and IPRCs and IEPs. Um, and I'm not talking about myself anymore, I'm talking about the situation. That's the situation. So what to do? Well, we, we will work with parents and children to try and advocate. When people call, my staff will listen, and they don't think you're a crazy parent if you call. I hope they understand, but the first step is to listen. And listen to the child, we will still want to meet the child and then make an advocacy plan, and then try and, and follow that plan, as long as the parent wants. I tell you there's a, a tension in the system about how to advocate. And, and I understand that. There are rights issues, but there are, it's in the act. My child and children in, of yours in this room have the right to an education, have a right to inclusion, have a right to the supports they need. And I, I get that, we can use the rights approach, and, um, but I haven't found it particularly useful. Because I've even seen in our province and other provinces where people have won human rights cases. But then by that time, their kid is gone, they're old, 
Or the one in the school still says, I got one EA for my entire school, so that's nice you won your human rights case, but so what? And I don't, they don't really say that, but I believe that so what is there. So when we advocate, oftentimes we struggle with where the rubber hits the road, which is with the teacher and the principal and the culture of the school. That, from, from my point of view, I kind of think if you've got the right teacher that is right for your child and they make a connection with your child, your kid's going to be okay. It's probably that simple. At least get through. And unfortunately that doesn't happen very often or all that time. But when you hear stories about this is what happened, the school system was good for me because parents made a connection with the principal or the teacher and they looked after that child in some way without the resources. Um, yeah. Is there, in the Education Act, it says that you were supposed to provide services to children with exceptionalities if you need them. Mm -hmm. But is there anything that can legally compel a school to provide those services? Because when I've spoken to somebody at special education at the ministry, they say they can't force school boards to provide services to all the groups right. with certain exceptionalities. Right. So what legal recourse do parents have? I don't believe there is. And I can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there is. I, I believe, um, and I was going to get to that, one of the things we can do besides the individual work is a systemic and connected with, and I, I've never asked any teachers for this, but I've connected with a fellow who was an activist in the disability community called David Lepofsky, who's talked a lot about um, standards. And I think there should be an educational standard the way there is an employment standard for kids with disabilities. And if there was, then like the employment standard, there is a legal recourse that school boards can get sued if they don't. And I frankly think, you know, and I'm almost done around this, but I was meeting somebody, it's not my idea, that a, a person from Japan who's studying here, um, she works as a professor of teaching, edu educational teaching in Japan. She's here at U of T. And she coined this term that I, I've taken on which is called uh, the educational maltreatment. That you can come into care of Children's Aid Society, for the, the word that Children's Aid Society uses is maltreatment, for maltreatment of children, children come into care. I think that what happens to kids in schools who don't get the supports they need is educational maltreatment. Because what it does to them as people and how it affects their life trajectory, and I think that's a very valid thing to think about. It's why there should be recourse to parents and boards should get sued if they don't <coughs> provide the resources that children need because they're mistreating children and they're affecting the trajectory of their lives. Anyway. I guess just uh, in terms of legal recourse, really the only, I mean there is the Education Act and all the process that you can go through but they don't actually force anybody to do anything. I mean they say what they should do. There is the human rights code, and you can make a human rights complaint, and the problem is that it is a long process. Um, although there, I think in all of these processes, the approach that's tried is mediation, to, uh, to mediate and, and bring people together, and having an outside party bring them together can sometimes help. But in terms of legal rights, uh, the schools are required to accommodate the needs of, of students with, with uh, disabilities. So people have taken human rights cases forward. Okay. Oh, there's not, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just uh, two comments. One is that every school board and every school will address the needs of special needs differently. Um, and across Ontario right now, there is an underfunding. Right now, across Ontario, school boards spend about $200 million over and above what they are actually funded. So with every school board, they're pulling money out of different areas as they're topping up their special ed budget line. And so there is a huge lack of resources as well that is a real struggle for every school board. Thank you.
sorry, I'm going to echo that also. And I, I have to say, I agree with what you say. I agree that we should be providing the right services, and we're not always doing that. And I agree, people, that. But the reality also is when you say you could sue a school board, a school board only has a fine element. You, when you say the Ministry of Education is the beast, that is the case. And really, it, it's less the school board you should be suing than the Ministry of well, Education yes. who don't provide the funding. I'm not suing anybody. But I don't like that. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm a little bit biased. I'm the chair of the Toronto District School Board. But, uh, but you did say you as the parent could sue the school board. No, I meant what, what I meant to so, say. Just so you, you they, get what I'm saying. If there was an educational standard, right. then there's an obligation legal obligation and legal recourse just the way there is if you if you're an employer and you don't accommodate your employee under right. under because there's an educational standard in employment then you can have legal recourse and, and there's a financial penalty to that employer if they don't it's a, it's right. actually a, a, a lot and that's what I'm looking for for a school system whether it's the school board and you're right or the ministry and that oh. dance Frankly, it's not helping. Especially. No, it's the same dance that exists in child welfare between the 46 Children's Aid Societies and the Ministry of Children's Youth Services about who's responsible for child welfare. And guess what? That dance needs to end. And actually, I, I sympathize with school boards. I do. I actually sympathize with them. There's nobody evil working in the Ministry of Education. I've met them. They're nice people. They want to do well by kids. Yeah. Same with the school boards. But the dance needs to stop because the kids in the middle are, are not being served well. And there are kids. So I don't want to talk about the school board or the ministry or the dance. I want to talk about the kids. And if this is what kids are getting, and, every, and, and it's common knowledge, then can we not get together and fix it? That's what kids want me to say. Fix it. Fix it. We don't care about how. Just fix it. I think parents want that too, but I want to, I know there's hands and I want to just move to the bigger thing because I haven't said what I think we're going to try and do about it because I can't just stand by and say that's the way it is. I want to find a way to move, the young people say move the mountain. Now, do it quick, please. Okay, sorry. Um, let me tell you, I want to speak to the idea of kids having a voice and tell you why. And it, it's, it's not just about kids with special education needs, but special needs in general. And um, I'm trying to think of which story, but the story I'm going to tell you is about, I went to this, um, this place where uh, children live. It's kind of a hospital where children live if they don't have long to live. And many are are very medically fragile. Um, some, uh, yeah. So I, I, I went on a tour of the place, it's amazing, and, and I, I was taken to the bed of this uh, young boy, he was 12, and he, he, wasn't, he wasn't verbal, and he couldn't uh, move at that point, um, and he was 12. And around his bed and in his room, he had Montreal Canadian stuff. And I thought, I, I said to the nurse, how do his parents know that he likes the Montreal Canadiens? Like, I, I, I didn't know. I, I'm a Montreal fan, so I think I noticed that. <laughs> and and, and he, she said, uh, well, they know, because he communicates with his tongue about yes or no questions. And they know him, and he communicates in relationship, this idea. And then I took away from that. A lot of things it's early on in my term but one of the things I took away from was that when that young boy was 12 years old and he's got Montreal stuff around him he's communicating to the world I like the Montreal Canadians and now he's a Montreal Canadian fan just like me he's not a dying young boy in a bed and when he names his world, that's called, in, in my, I'm a teacher by training, and I have a, you know, I, I still stick with Paulo Freire as teacher by training. He named his world, and in naming the world, he became human. He became a human being. And 
And that's why that 12-year-old in that bed who is not able to communicate needs a voice because he needs to be human just the way he is. And if we deny him that space to have a voice, we render him an object and not a subject in the world. All this big theory, but it's why I believe young people with special needs deserve to have a voice and opportunity to find a way to use it, to name their world. So we came back, and we've done this with, you're right, with children in care, and we've done it with First Nations young people, and it's been rather, fairly successful. And you can ask me later about those. But we've said we have to find a way to raise the voice, partner with children and youth with special needs to bring their issues forward, partner with them. So we reached out, it's taken time, because we, to be honest, our office didn't know how to do that. I work with teens, and I work with teens in care with the children's mental health system. I kind of knew how to work with teens. I did not know how to work with the boy in that hospital. I did not, even though until I had my sons, I didn't know how to work with little kids, or how to even help them name their own world. I, I'm probably not as good at it with my own kids as I am with others. You know how that works, right? <laughs> um, so I said we have to do that. So we reached out to people who were doing it in, in uh, hospitals, um, in schools. And frankly, the school system was, yes. And I'll speak to the Toronto District School. I met with Donna Kwan. I met uh, Sammy and I, who Sammy's leading that, that project. I have something to say. Met with 250 child and youth workers from the Toronto District School Board who all said, because what we wanted was can we raise the voice of these children? Just let's hear what they have to say. And it will do them good if they get to do that. We don't know how they'll do it. Make a video, art, sing, speak, whatever. Can we do that? Child and youth workers in the board, you touch thousands of kids, thousands of kids with quote, quote special needs. You can do this because that's your training. To a person, they all, I remember we did this speech and then they came up in the front because the director said, all the child youth workers who want to, one kid, that's all, 250, one kid, you'll find a kid in the board who will say something about something. Could be positive too, right? This is what I'm getting at the school. They all came up to the front and we were hopeful we'd get tons of submissions. We went to the, the school unions, OSSTF, the Elementary Teachers Federation, very excited. We're going to work with you. OPSU, um, yes, we wanted submissions from kids and from parents and caregivers. And we said to those child youth workers, you tell us your stories. You can be anonymous. We have it online. You can give us the stories anonymous. We didn't get those stories. We didn't get those stories from all those systems, I don't think. We did get lots of submissions from kids. Lots. I'd say, I, I know we have 150, 200 submissions. Many of them are from groups of kids. So probably a thousand young people in total, children and young people. There was a group in, uh, uh, of kids in Grand River who have autism, who were nonverbal. So we had one event to launch that, and they came and sang the national anthem. Um, and they asked us, and I'll tell you that they're going to be involved in a sec, but that was their contribution, even though they couldn't, right? And they had, um, one, some of them had one-to-one -one workers, and their one-to-one -one worker did art with them, and then spoke about what they thought of that child, and that was their submission, the art, what the one-to-one -one worker said, and their song. Um, what we do, we call that the gathering voices stage, which we've done. Sammy was leading that, and then we, um, have analyzed what did the young people say. One of the things, of course, they talked about, because they could talk, the question to them was in general, how are you doing? And what could make your life, uh, what could help you? We didn't ask it this way, and we asked it differently to different people, but we were asking them what could help you get to where you want to go in life, achieve your dreams, whatever. The two things that they said, um, that, that I remember as themes, the first one was about their parent, their family. Even if they didn't have a family, because some might have been in care or in group homes, or the people that were caring for them. 
I, I was stunned. I didn't actually believe, know that that's what they were going to say. Um, they said they worry about their parents. They worry two things. What's going to happen to them when their parents aren't there? And they, uh, it makes me upset to think this, but, and, and they, uh, they worry about, are their parents okay? Because they say we're putting a hell of a lot of stress on the, our parents. So they worry about you. The other thing that they talked about was to a person in the school system. I remember to one group in uh, Thames Valley Children's Rehab Center, I was saying, well, I didn't expect you would be talking about schools. I thought you'd be talking about this, you know, su supports in the community or services, and they go, uh, Erwin, are you an idiot? Like, how, where do you think we spend most of our days? Of course. And this one girl, I'll never forget that statement, was, I, she has um, cerebral palsy, and she said, I used to think school could be a mirror of what society could be, and now I know school is a mirror of what society is. So, so you have this Minister of Education coming, and when we do this, we gather the voices. The next step is to bring the young people together with decision makers. So in the spring, we will invite every young person who wants to, to be with us, and in their own way, however they want to do that, present what they have to say to decision makers. When we've done this with children in care and First Nations, uh, we have ministers and deputy ministers, and it's not just the, the um, people you think. We ask across government to come. Just come. <coughs> it's going to be safe. You're not going to get embarrassed, but we need you to come and listen. And we need school board presidents. And we. I'm going to speak to the association of school boards in the, in a few weeks, and I'll be asking them to come. This gathering, and we don't know how we're going to organize it because young people are going to help us. There's a a young people's advisory group of 45 young people, as young as 12, as old as in their 20s. All range of special needs who are organizing all this. They will organize that meeting with us and tell us how they have already said it needs to be fun, there needs to be different spaces. So if kids have autism and there's some kids with autism on that group and they have to have a, a room where they can pillow you, I'm looking at that right, you know exactly. Well, we didn't know that, but the parents who are parents of those kids have helped us figure out if this is going to happen, how do we do it in a way that these young people can use their voice, become, they are human, but you understand, be seen as human, be visible, be visible as humans and not a, pay, a, a problem that costs money. And they will speak to those decision makers. And they've coined the term, they, they hate the term special needs, they've used the term warriors. And they don't mean warriors because um, they're war fighting for something good, which I think they do. They mean warriors because they live day in and day out with whatever they're dealing with, and they understand themselves to be fighters and warriors. And they think their parents are too. So they use that term, and they talk about moving the mountain. That was their term, right, Sam? They say, we're going to move a mountain. Because, they say, this is a big problem. It's not like, with, with respect to the school board, it's not like something the school board is going to fix, or even they think knows how to fix. There are bigger issues here. If we're going to have inclusion, and they've debated that, are they going to make a recommendation about inclusion? But they've debated about, you know, if this is what inclusion is, maybe it's not good for us. But the idea is good. So how are we going to do it? And that's a big issue, and schools can't fix it by them. Cells, and neither can a Ministry of Education. It's going to need a bigger effort. And they don't even know what that effort's going to look like, but they're going to say to the government, here's our recommendation. I'm sure they'll make quick, they, I call them quick wins. They'll tell the government, do this, do this, do this. But the real problem is much bigger. And they're going to say to them in some way, let's do it together. Don't let go of it. We're not, well, they're going to say, we're not letting go. Don't think we're going to tell you what we think and you can go away and fix it. No. We want us and other young people like us to be involved in helping you figure out what to fix it.
how to fix it, and they'll develop the process. I just want to finish, and what I believe is, and I've seen it in some of the change in the other systems, in the help having these young people being part of the solution will come, that is actually part of the solution in itself. If they have a voice, if they're respected, if they're listened to, if the parents have a voice and are respected and are listened to, you are halfway home. It is not all about money. It is not. Because that's part of the solution. And I believe that will happen. And in the spring, we're going to take, and we're going to help them take their best shot at starting to move the mountain. And I, I hope that if you're here from a system, you join them and, and join, reach out with them and, and uh, say, yeah, we're with you. And let's figure this out together. And it'll be safe. I promise it will be safe. It's not about shaming and blaming. It's about saying, that's where we are, we can do better. And I just wanted to say all of that because of the challenge about will they speak up, and I, I think they will. So this sounds great. My question to you was going to be around, do you know of a broad-based activist group, either at the parent level or student level, and it sounds like this is what you're you're creating for springtime with a target? Yes. And so my question to you now is, how are you reaching out across Ontario to make sure that, that the student voices coming to the table in the spring is as big a group as possible? Like SEAC, and I think every school board has mandated. So I just, I'm interested in how you're, how you're broadening reach and if, if there are things that we can do in the room to help facilitate that reach. Well, I think, you know, um, there, I would say that we need help having that reach facilitated. So when I go to the Association of School Boards, right, I, I would ask them, we need you there, and can you tell other people who need to be there? We'll get the, we'll pay, because co all that costs money, right? So we have to pay for the kids from, a, and remember it's across Ontario to get there, and we'll start with the young people who've made submissions from across Ontario, or their groups, and, and their parents, because they usually, They'll have to come with somebody, oftentimes. So we'll make sure they're there, but we are going to need help from decision makers to get other decision makers there. And, and so if you have ideas um, and you're willing to help us make that happen, sure, that'd be great. Beyond, well, beyond, it, beyond going to OPSPA, is that who you're speaking about? But, or no, I, I, I can't tell you the number of people in the school system. It's not, remember, it's not just the school system. So I've been to every union that exists. I've been to the, uh, the trustees, the student trustees of all the school boards. I've come twice now and I've talked to them and they brought it back to the association of, there's an association of mm -hmm. school trustees. They student said trustees, they brought it back to them. I brought it back, I've spoken to, um, there's been a conference of principals of the school system. I've spoken to the conference of um, the student success work as teachers. Um, and frankly, everybody is saying this is a great, this is great, but I, I can still need help. There, the parents, there's an association of parent support groups in the province, so they know about it. Um, we we'll talked to you guys about when it. And you were group. mentioning SIAC, and, and one of the things I sit on is PAC on SIAC, which is the provincial group that represents a special education advisory committee so that would be one way that if we took that information gave it to all our uh, members and they send it out to all of their CF reps but I think also going out to all the parent councils yes. is another it you know it is another way to reach people as well yeah I'm, I'm sorry if I missed something and everyone else in the room knows but what's the name of the project that you're talking I about? have something to say okay thank you and it's on you, your website, right? Yeah, it's on our website. I was just asking Sammy if he wants to say anything. I was promising I wouldn't say anything. He does do speeches, but he didn't come prepared to do one. I'm doing okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's, your, what's your website? www.provincialadvocate.on.ca And my, if you want to email, um, take my email. It's Erwin dot 
Elman at provincialadvocate.org.ca. So now I'll just connect you. Questions and comments. Um, you guys do great work. My son's at the Provincial Demonstration School oh. in London. <laughs> yeah. So he will be meeting up with you in two weeks with yeah. John Meston yeah. in Toronto. My advocate, John Meston. Yes, yeah, so um, they, they do amazing work. And talking about labels, my son was so happy when he found out what the issue was. And he will tell anybody, I know. I, he'll walk up to you, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> he does not feel labeled in any way. And he's proud of who he is. He just learns different. And once he got to in a place where he could learn, he has soared. Like he got to fifth grade and couldn't read cat. I got him in a free program and got him, you know, two years of tutoring to a certain spot. Then he went to the demonstration school and he's just blown them away. And he's just come out of a shell. He's a leader, he's on student parliament, he's <coughs> going like it's it's unbelievable the difference because he's like I can, I've gotten somewhere where I can learn. They do, get it. Do people know what the demonstration school is? No. Do, no. You mind, do you mind saying what it is? A provincial demonstration school is, there's three in Ontario. They're run by the Ministry of Education. Um, you've probably heard about the ones for the deaf and hearing. So there's, there's Robarts and uh, Milton and Belleville. Yeah. Yeah. Amethyst is yeah. connected yeah. to Robarts. It's My daughter goes there. A oh. residential school. So my child had to leave at 11 years old. He lives on his, he goes there. So I've been two years without my child yeah. because the school system yeah. could not teach him to read. Yeah. But they do an amazing job. I'm not disputing that. But I should not have been forced to make that decision yeah. to send my kid to residential school. He made, he knew he needed to go. Like, he told me, I have to go there in fourth grade when I showed it to him. But 40 kids at each school is the cap. So now you get to feel guilty because your kid got in, and there's thousands of others that didn't make the cut. But if you're not the fighter to get them in there or find out about it because it's a very, very tightly kept secret, they can't advertise it, they can't. Teachers won't tell you about it. Principals don't know about it. So if you find out about it, you're the lucky one to get in. But it's an amazing program, and they work with those kids. John's there like every month advocating for those kids. And are so, there only so many kids from each board that are allowed to go? No. It, it, it's, it's a central intake process, um, and, and they decide um, Usually, year. usually they would go to the low, the closest one geographically, but there are other considerations. And actually, speaking about the fact that most people don't know about it, I don't think you need to feel guilty because, from what I've heard, it's not that they're turning people away; it's that there's not enough people know about it that that they can. Well, because they can't advertise it. So in, in the school board, they won't tell you about it. it they it, literally asked me, how did you find out about us? Well, Although it, 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 it should side, be. Though, because I, the family across the street from me is, uh, speaks, speaks English as a second language, and they got the letter home saying your son's being identified as special needs, and here was like four pages of text to get through. Yes, it was the Toronto District School Board. Um, and in there, it did describe the provincial um, school boards, and they knew enough to recognize that it said Brockville, and it said London, and, they, and so they came to us and said, does this mean they're taking our son away? Uh -huh. like that, so yeah. so it's the first, it, it, they can advertise, but don't forget that it's really a horrible, what a horrible solution to have to send your son away, and, and really, it, I, I don't know if that's the answer. I wonder if I can just push a little bit, though, to understand speaking from that perspective of, of diversity, because I also uh, was hanging out earlier this week with some educational researchers, and they were talking about uh, the performance of different ethnocultural groups in the school board. And we know the over-labeling that happens. Like, for instance, black students are 13% of the um, school board here, and yet they're only 3% of the gifted students, and yet they are 22% of the special ed class. Those are all stats that have come out. People for education has been um, very good at talking about that. 
And so, so you're left with a, so then what? Because the label, as much as it sometimes helps, my own son has a reading disability and felt that relief when he knew why, why he was dumb, he said to me, I think he's free. But it also um, ends up limiting. And so the, the, these educational researchers have been tracking what happens to kids that grow up. And as soon as you get that label, then you're put into a applied course that's not academic, and then you'll never get to college or, or university. So there's, a, there's the whole uh, ethnocultural, racial uh, dimensions of racism stuff and class that really worry me about this, and 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 our streaming and stuff. So I do think it's important to hear from children and youth, but we need to know where we're going to take that because there are much bigger problems than just whether we've heard them. We actually should be able to recognize some of the problems now. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. Um, I'm quite sure the young people will say, we don't expect you to know. Because if you would have fixed it, if you would have known, you would have fixed it by now. Mm -hmm. What they will say to you, I think, is that we want to help. Include us in figuring out the solutions. And I, I, I'm quite sure that's what they'll say. And that's what they've said about child welfare. Um, that's what they've said. First Nations young people have said. Um, include us in figuring out the solution. They've said that to their First Nation leadership as well as the federal and provincial government. We want to be included, and we, uh, I'm, I remember. Um, so, are you optimistic in wrestling these laws? I, you know, I, I am, and I want to okay. say something in the end about being hopeful because I asked the ministry once. Um, there's two places I'm thinking about, but I asked the ministry, okay, show me a school. Cause it, the young people were, had been, what I'd been hearing was, we, inclusion isn't working, inclusion isn't working. I knew if I dared to stand up and say that we should get rid of inclusion, that would not be where I would want to go. But that's, they're not saying get rid of it, they're saying it's not working. So I said to the ministry, show me a place, go send me to a school where you really think it's working. And I went to this school in um, Ottawa. And it was interesting because it was the same school size of school as my son's school. It, it, um, maybe I had four or five hundred students and it was elementary, so up you know, to grade six, I think. And the first thing that happened was I went to the principal, well, I called first, but I came in and I sat with the principal and he said, uh, why are you here? And I said, well, the ministry actually said I should go see your school. It's an example of a school where inclusion really works. And he's going, oh, okay. Uh, he said, but you don't want to talk to me then. You want to talk to my, my teachers and you want to talk to the students. So I arranged that to happen. And I thought, oh, okay. That's one of the reasons why inclusion is working. That's right. The attitude, right? And then I sat with the teacher and the, um, some of the students. And she was telling, she was showing me um, how some of the the young people who had autism were integrated in some of the classes I had made on iPads with uh, students who didn't have autism, these light books. It was one about, this, I guess this one student went horseback riding and it was therapeutic, but she brought in pictures from home and the student, I think they were like grade four students, learned on the iPad how to make a, a photo story on the iPad and they did it together. So they're showing me how the class did that. I thought, oh, okay voice, inclusion, and then I saw the, the way that the students owned the school and the play yard because the teachers were telling me how the students had this uh, system of what to do with the play yards and they put, uh, they included issues around disability and designing the, the playground in, in the school. And I thought, okay, and I went back to the principal and said, how many EAs do you have? Because I hear in every school I go to, they need more EAs. He says, no principal in the right mind would ever tell you they don't need more EAs. <laughs> but we have what we have, and we're able to deal with it. And I thought, OK, if his school can do that, and have that culture, and have the students and the staff feel like they own the school, and it feels good when you walk in, then that's hopeful to me. And when I've, I've gone to that school about inclusion, I went to a school, is it, you'll remember, is it Beverly School? Mm -hmm. It's a school that, yeah, what, yeah? yeah. you know that school? Highest needs. Highest needs. Highest needs. Yeah. And I don't remember the principal's name. 
to not hear. That's an amazing school. It's another school, and it's not an, a school, it's a, a school that's not have inclusion, but I walk into that school, and it's, it's uh, something that you might recognize, not just schools. If you go to any service, youth service or children's service, do you know the idea when you walk in somewhere and you go, oh, you feel it? Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Both those schools, you walk in and you go, I'm home, this is good, this feels good. And if you do as a visitor, kids do when they walk in, and that Beverly School feels like that. It's a community, and it's belonging, and it's, so it, I'm hopeful because it is possible. And again, I do think, I, I like this um, People for Education report about this, because they did say more money is needed, but they also said it's not just about money. And I think that's true. Because there are schools that are finding a way, and maybe it's, you know, I've been challenging myself about those schools. Is it, is the school in Ottawa because of the neighborhood it's in, and if it was, is it a really wealthy neighborhood, it's middle class, but if it was in a more um, lower income neighborhood, would it be the same? Is it the, what is it about that school? And that's the choice, but it is possible, because I've seen it. And I'm sure the people from the board have, can take me to schools in the Toronto District School Board and say, see, it's possible. And that makes me hopeful that, that we can get beyond this, but we're gonna need, um, we're gonna need change to happen. And all that dancing, we just went through a period of dance with unions and stuff. All that dancing needs to stop. And the way it's gonna stop is if we let children lead us. I believe it. Um, so yeah. Um, my comment was around uh, dyslexia. I've got a child who's gifted dyslexic. And uh, the school board didn't really have any programs for my child, so I purchased uh, tutoring my, privately. And he learned to read after a year and a half of, of intensive tutoring. Now, the TSB did uh, do some pilot testing of a couple of products uh, for kids with dyslexia. One of them is a computer program called Fast Forward. Mm -hmm. And another one is a, a written program from the Hospital for Sick Children called Empower. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And if they're both used correctly, they do help point at two dyslexics. I don't think there's a single program that's going to have, help every single dyslexic child um, because they all have different issues. But those sorts of tools could be very helpful if we get them into the classrooms. Mm -hmm. Of course, it takes money, it takes computers for fast forward, or it takes a teacher with the right amount of training. And I think that's something that would help kids all over the province if we get those tools to them. Yep. Yeah. But it's also the kids who have used those tools when their, their voice is heard, yeah. you know? It, I mean, it's one thing for the teacher to say it works, one thing for the parents to say it works, but when you hear from the kids themselves that this really helps me, I think that really is powerful. As I want to say. How, how are we doing for time? We have four minutes. Oh. It was five minutes Sorry. of the table. <laughs> okay. <laughs> With those I'm programs, so oh, sorry. Sorry. Can I, you didn't speak yet, right? Okay. I just, wanted, I just wanted to thank you for what you said earlier in comment. Well, first, thank you for your, your story, because there's a lot of parents here, and I think you talked about a lot of our kids. Um, when you started with them, damn. It's okay, I feel it. Seeing your son's goal at eight, and how happy it is, he is. Yep. And then in grade one. <laughs> The problems that start in grade one, you described my son who's now pushed through, shouldn't have gone to high school, did have to go and did have to leave his home school for one year to go to a special school because he didn't fit in. You know, just like it happening to all of us. Um, you know, now the ne next step for him is going to be youth justice on the track he's on because he doesn't fit in, but damn. What you said about employment standards, you know, we can go to our jobs, and if the person you're working beside harasses you, or if your boss calls you an effing R word, you have that recourse of employment standards, okay? But in the morning, we drop our kids off, we, we put them on the yellow bus, or we throw them in our minivan and drop them off at school, and tell them, be good, have a good day. We, who are supposed to protect them, we drop them off knowing they're going to be called, they're going to be harassed, and then they're going to be sent to the principal's office. They're going to be ostracized because the kid next to him or her is going to say, you're just a 
idiot, you know, because they've been suspended in grade one, they've been sent to the principal's office two times a week since grade two, and now the kids know how you can treat that child, and they have no recourse, and then we do it every single day. Go to school and be good. Go to school and be good. I hope the principal doesn't call me today because it's your fault. You're ending up in the principal's office. So thank you about what you said about employment standards because when I speak to other, pa other parents, I keep saying to them, our children need to have at least the very minimum standard that we have when we go to work. They need to have those rights in their classroom. So thank you. Mm. Thank you.